Hello everyone. I'm not sure I need to keep saying this, but this is Jared Taylor from the Biology 112 teaching team here at UBC. In this video, I would like to introduce you to the topic of gene regulation, which is something we spend a decent amount of time on here in Biology 112. In the last video, I asked and answered the question, how do cells use their information? Today, I would like to tweak that question a little bit and ask, when? When do cells use their information? Now, as I mentioned previously, cells store their information in the form of genes within their genomes. So really, this question should be, when do cells use their genes? The obvious answer might be all of the time, but in reality, that isn't the case. As an example, consider two types of cells in your body, skin cells and muscle cells. Both cell types have the same complement of DNA and genes, or to say it another way, they have identical genomes. Yet, skin cells and muscle cells are different in appearance and function. This differentiation is due to each of them using a different set of the available genes to produce RNA and protein. A better way to state this is to say that each cell type is transcribing a different set of genes, and we refer to this as having different transcriptomes. The main takeaway of this is that these two cell types are clearly not using all of their genes all of the time. Another common example of this, and one we will cover in detail here in Biology 112, is bacteria and food molecules. Bacterial cells often contain many different genes that code for the proteins necessary to grab and digest different sugar molecules. However, making these proteins is a waste of energy and resources if those sugar molecules are not available. Thus, those genes are not normally transcribed. When the cell detects the availability of a certain sugar molecule in the environment, it can quickly respond by transcribing the relevant genes to make the proteins that will allow it to absorb and eat the food. So, returning to our question of when do cells use their genes, the answer is when they need to. By the way, we usually refer to cells using their genes as cells expressing their genes. To put it more simply, we refer to this as gene expression. As I just showed you, cells don't want to express their genes all of the time, or ever in some cases. Thus, they need a way to control when and where the genes are expressed. The mechanisms for controlling gene expression are collectively known as gene regulation. Okay, that seemed like we took a bit of a winding road to get where we needed to be, so let's crack on. As we discussed previously, going from gene to protein requires two steps, transcription and translation. Since performing either of these processes for unneeded proteins would be a waste, it makes sense that most gene regulation is about controlling the first step, transcription. There are some exceptions to this, but we don't need to worry about those here. By the way, everything I am about to talk about uses bacterial cells as the example. These are easier to understand, and the concepts are still applicable in other types of cells. Regulating transcription means controlling when it starts and how often it occurs. Recall that transcription initially begins with a gene's promoter. Therefore, what we are really talking about is regulating how easily the RNA polymerase can bind at the promoter and transcribe the gene. The first type of regulation is the promoter sequence itself. Different promoters can have different DNA sequences that may be more or less effective at allowing RNA polymerase and the related proteins to bind. We refer to this as the strength of a promoter. A strong promoter is one that allows the RNA polymerase to easily land on the DNA and quickly start transcription, allowing for lots of RNA production. On the other hand, a weak promoter is one where the RNA polymerase has difficulty binding to the DNA. Eventually, the RNA polymerase can land and start transcription, but this delay means that less RNA is produced over time from this gene, in some cases, a lot less. So this is one form of regulation, but it isn't something that can be adjusted directly by the cell since the DNA sequence can't be changed in any meaningful way. So how can cells ramp transcription up or down as needed for any given gene? Well, as I have said many times before, 
When cells want to do something, the answer is almost always a protein, although in this case the DNA is involved too. First, let's talk about ramping down transcription. This is usually the type of regulation that cells use with strong promoters. We refer to this as negative regulation because the level of transcription decreases with this type of control. Promoters that require regulation are usually accompanied by a nearby DNA sequence known as an operator. The operator allows a special type of protein known as a regulatory protein to bind to the DNA. For negative regulation, the regulatory protein is called a repressor since its job is to repress transcription. Once bound to the DNA, the repressor can stop transcription in one of two ways. Some repressors simply bind to the operator and get in the way of the RNA polymerase binding to the promoter. Alternatively, the repressor may allow the RNA polymerase to bind, but it prevents it from moving down the DNA. In either case, transcription is prevented while the repressor is sitting on the operator. Another way of thinking about this is that the repressor protein makes the promoter seem much weaker than normal. So if that is regulation by ramping down transcription, how about regulation by ramping up transcription? Well, that also exists, and we refer to it as, surprise, surprise, positive regulation. This type of regulation is more common for weaker promoters that already have difficulty in initiating transcription. Again, we have an operator sequence nearby in the DNA, and again, a regulatory protein can bind. This type of regulatory protein, however, is known as an activator because it helps activate and start transcription. While it is sitting on the operator, the activator helps RNA polymerase to quickly land on the promoter and start transcription. This means that the activator makes the promoter seem much stronger than normal. So that is the regulatory proteins and the two types of regulation. This of course begs the question, how does the cell control the regulatory proteins? Don't they always bind and do what they do? Well, it turns out in many cases, regulatory proteins can respond to a signal molecule. Where the signal molecule comes from is something we discuss in Biology 112 lecture. But for now, let me just say that the concentration of the signal molecules change how the regulatory proteins behave. This happens because the signal molecules can bind to the regulatory proteins and change their shape from functional to non-functional or vice versa. Like regulatory proteins, there are two types of signal molecules. Signal molecules that cause an increase in transcription are called inducers. On the other hand, signal molecules that cause a decrease in transcription are called co-repressors. Note that both types of signal molecules can be used with both types of regulatory proteins. Some inducers control activator proteins, while others control repressors. Likewise, some co-repressors control activators, and some control repressors. This means there are four possible regulatory combinations. You will see some examples of these during Biology 112 lecture. And that, dear students, was an introduction to gene regulation. We will spend a decent chunk of time in lecture discussing these concepts in detail and showing you some actual examples of how these regulatory systems work inside cells.